say how glad I am to be here after being down the road at EPATH this week. But I do have to thank EPATH for one thing. As you can see, I had a little trouble coming up with a compelling title for this talk. And then EPATH decided to close out by blasting the anthem, Don't Stop Believin', and that would be a great title for what I'm going to talk about today. In many ways, trans and the internet have grown up together. What it means to be trans, sorry, um, from the 1980s on, the internet has been a prime site for gender exploration, and it's really easy to understand why. The internet connects us across great distances. It links us with strangers who share our most unusual and secretive interests, and it allows us a level of control over the information that we share with others that just doesn't exist offline. Online, you really are who you say you are in the way that you could never be in what some of us still think of as the real world. But over the last 30 years, some huge shifts have taken place online and when it comes to the people who think of themselves as trans and what trans means. Back then, you had to seek out transsexual content in the dark corners of Usenet. Now you log on and trans is everywhere. Most research on these online communities focuses on older males who identify as transsexual or transgender. And researchers tend to take it for granted that online communities provide an unmitigated positive support, source of support and information. But what if the role of online communities isn't quite so straightforward? What if research done on earlier populations doesn't transfer to the explosion of young people, particularly girls and young women, identifying as trans since the 2010s? What about the possibility of social influence over transgender identity? These kinds of questions are why I wanted to research the attitudes, beliefs, and knowledge about gender that young women encounter online, and the intentions and expectations that they express regarding transition and detransition. My research draws on an online content analysis of five Reddit communities that you can see here, with a focus on female members who are questioning their gender, identifying as transgender, or who have desisted or detransitioned. I've tried to approach my research the way that any anthropologist or sociologist would by taking a close look and trying to understand the local culture. When someone joins any community, they undergo a process of socialization. In online communities that are primarily text-based, the most visible form of socialization is into what you say and don't say and how you say and don't say it. There's a lot we could talk about today <laughs> when it comes to socialization into trans identity in online communities. This is a list of codes from my online content analysis, and I would be happy to talk um, after hours if people have, especially if people have like research leads for me. But since we don't have all day, in fact, we don't have very much time left together at all, I want to zero in on the subject of doubt and the strategies that members of online trans communities use to deal with doubt. I also want to say a quick word about clinical relevance. The message from online trans communities, well, what I would say is from the beginning, online trans communities have focused on sharing advice on navigating clinical encounters, which in practice has often meant subverting clinical gatekeeping. That means that there's encouragement to members of online trans communities to present the right profile when they show up in an exam room. You want clinicians to know that you know yourself. You know what you want. You are not supposed to bring doubt into the exam room because doubt risks derailing access to pharmaceutical and surgical interventions the patients come to believe that they need. So if you're a clinician like Joanna Olson Kennedy and you don't know what to listen for, you're not going to hear it. When Olson Kennedy says she doesn't send patients to therapy when she starts them on insulin, so why would she send her gender dysphoric patients to therapy before starting them on puberty blockers or hormones? I know that she doesn't know how to listen for doubt. Or when Helen Weberly says, diagnosis is very straightforward. It's self-diagnosis. I can't know their identity. I know that they do not understand the places where so many people form trans identities online. So as I said, I've been down the road at EPATH this week. The clinicians gathered there really don't want to talk about doubt any more than they want to talk about regret and medical harm and detransition. That's because the presence and persistence of serious doubts threaten the basis of gender-affirming care. Affirmative care is based on the premise that patients know who they are 
and that it is not the role of clinicians to scrutinize identity claims. Clinicians narrow their curiosity to questions about where their patients locate themselves in the gender universe or what their embodiment goals are. This is putting curiosity and clinical inquiry on an awfully tight leash. But the exam room isn't the only place where it's hard to talk about doubt. Doubts are also taboo in online trans communities, and taboos must be handled with the greatest care. Doubting other people's gender self-identity is pretty strictly forbidden in online communities. Questioning the concept of gender identity isn't going to fly either. But you're allowed to express reservations about your own identity and the decision to transition as long as you couch these doubts in the right terms. In online trans communities, if you listen, you will hear the most serious doubts expressed. Am I really trans? Should I do this? Could this be related to sexual abuse or trauma that I experienced? What if I'm just a lesbian? What if getting help for my other issues makes my dysphoria go away? What if I'm wrong? What if I feel like transition isn't helping? Is my life better or worse since I came out as trans? What if I regret it? These conversations make it clear just how fragile transgender identity can be. There are also many ways to talk about doubt. And I would say that these kind of boil down to variations on three basic and often intertwining themes. The first is internalized transphobia, which is basically I'm self-rejecting because I haven't conquered the lifetime of socialization that attaches shame to transgender identity. The second is imposter syndrome, the feeling that you're faking it and that you are asking others in your life to fake it too. And the third is intrusive thoughts, which is labeling the doubts that you have as disordered cognitions that pathologically undermine who you really are. So let's start with internalized transphobia. This is sometimes referred to as internalized cissexism, for which I'm pretty sure we can thank Julia Serrano. When, and it's when someone who identifies as trans feels ashamed of their gender identity or expression, or experiences doubt or tries to deny their transgender identity. Here we have a young person who is on the verge of undergoing a double mastectomy, but her dad keeps asking questions that she finds uncomfortable. She says, my dad always stews up my internalized transphobia when I'm finally happy. I'm doing my best to see this as a medical treatment for dysphoria, but there's always a lingering fear in the back of my head. Does anybody else have this happen? What have you done to ease the anxiety? The next post, these are all coming up under, they usually have internalized transphobia in the subject line. Um, the next post shows the conflict between a sense of identity formed online and a sense of identity that is rooted in offline interactions. Quote, right now, whenever people who know me in real life use masculine terms and pronouns for me, I feel like it's forced or they're somehow lying to me to make me feel better. It's unhealthy, it's self-destructive. And I know it all comes back to this awful internalized bullshit. But has anyone experienced something similar? Did it get better when you were further along in your transition? It makes me worry that the reason I feel uncomfortable socially transitioning is that I'm somehow not trans and that I'm just confused. But that can't be right because online and in my own head, I'm very happy with they, he pronouns and being treated like a guy. The next says, I feel like a faker. I'm afraid that once I get the surgeries, I'll be hit with regret because I was actually cis the whole time. Is this internalized transphobia and dysphoria? No matter what I do, I still feel female, and it's driving me insane. I've come to think of, of sorry, think of overcoming internalized transphobia or self-doubt as doing the work. Gender questioning youth are called upon to dismantle the entire structure of transphobia that they have supposedly taken on board. And this task is taken to mirror the broader work that society as a whole is supposed to undertake on behalf of trans acceptance. I wanna be clear about what this means. When you doubt and invalidate yourself, you doubt and invalidate other trans people. You harm other trans people whenever you don't perceive them or think about them in the way that others, they want others to see them. So when you have internalized transphobia, you are seen as self-victimized but also as a perpetrator of transphobia, even if you never open your mouth. 
This effectively abolishes the privacy of the mind as a space where you're free to explore ideas. So not only must you express yourself publicly in these communities in approved ways, but you are supposed to think only approved thoughts. Operating under these expectations, questions, under the operating under these expectations, questions and doubts, which are already threatening to a fragile sense of self, produce added anxiety and fear that you are causing harm, that your treachery will be discovered, and that you, you, you will lose the community that you rely on for emotional support if you cannot bring your questions and doubts, your internalized transphobia, under control. Next up, we have imposter syndrome. This can be characterized as feelings of self-doubt and incompetence that persist in spite of one's qualifications. In other words, imposter syndrome describes the uncomfortable feeling that you are not what you appear to be. Now, it's usually used in the sense that you feel like an imposter, even though you're not an imposter. That's why it's called imposter syndrome and not being an imposter or <laughs> self-awareness. <laughs> when it comes to trans, the question of whether one is an imposter or not is trickier. It's a subject, it's subject to fluctuating personal understandings of gender and sex. The question of what it means to feel like an imposter and whether that sense of self-doubt provides an accurate or false picture of the situation is an open one. But here's what the Trans Guide to Mental Health and Wellbeing has to say about the subject. Quote, one thing I think is worth remembering is that imposters don't get imposter syndrome. If you were really a gender fraud, you would be reveling in your purposeful deceit. Instead, you're anxious about whether you're a good person. Likewise, worrying about whether you're trans enough is a pretty universally available, uni sorry, is a pretty universally trans experience. And it's actually an excellent sign that you are who you say you are. The Gender Dysphoria Bible, a resource that's frequently shared and cited in online trans communities, rushes in with similar reassurance. Quote, here's the thing. Only trans people are worried about whether they're actually transgender, end quote. Only trans people doubt whether they're trans. So doubt equals trans. <laughs> Resources like this suggest that not only is feeling like an imposter normal and not a cause for concern, but feeling like an imposter is a sign that your transgender identity is authentic. This can also sound like, what if I'm faking it? What if I'm just a confused girl? Um, none of it feels authentic. I feel like a fraud. I don't know how to relate to people anymore. And there's always that voice in the back of my head, or that voice in the back of my head always tells me that I'm just a fraud who was riddled with trauma from a young age. Last up, we have intrusive thoughts. This is another borrowed term this time from the realm of obsessive compulsive disorder and other anxiety disorders, where intrusive thoughts refer to unwanted thoughts, images, impulses, and urges that can occur spontaneously or be cued by external or internal stimuli. Typically, these thoughts are distressing, hence intrusive, and they tend to recur. In online trans communities, intrusive thoughts usually refer to recurring doubts and unwanted negative thoughts about trans identity or transition. They're also sometimes referred to as brainworms or turf thoughts. Here's some examples. Quote, I'm OCD, so I constantly go through cycles of doubt in my identity. At the end of the day, I know exactly who I am, but I can't stop the intrusive thoughts from questioning it. This poster breaks down in great length the, what she calls, quote, the basic train of thought of the vibe, the poster's words for intrusive thoughts which includes the persistent thought that she cannot, quote, cannot escape being female, that her transition will never be complete, that she must accept her biology. The end result, quote, nothing but mental pain and self-hatred from every angle of the argument, because I'm stuck in a middle ground, and I always will be. Quote, I feel like my life since I was 12 has been a lie or some trick of my own brain, some sick obsession I was too consumed by to see. Is it possible my dysphoria and perception of my gender was created entirely by a hyperfixation? I want to break down one post in detail. The poster titled it, quote, struggling with imposter syndrome, question mark, and it brings kind of all three of the threads that I've been talking about together. Quote, I'm confronting some weird things since I started medically transitioning, and people have started actually referring to me as a boy, way more than when I was just out socially. 
I always have this intrusive feeling when someone correctly genders me that like, quote, ah, I see, this person is either humoring me or making fun of me, for I am not a real boy, and they know it, even though I have obviously never felt this way about anyone else, and I do know that everyone who does this just genuinely sees me as a man. It's a pretty transphobic thing to keep directing at myself. Did anyone else, and it kind of feels like an extension of imposter syndrome, did anyone else struggle with this when you first came out and started transitioning? What did you do to train yourself out of it? if anything. Might just take some getting used to, to believe that other people do see me the way that I see myself. Here you can really see how these different strategies work. First, the poster applies the imposter syndrome frame. Then the poster contains the doubts, labeling those doubts as intrusive feelings, and portraying doubt as an irrational response to being, quote, correctly gendered. The poster sets up diffusing threats to community beliefs and norms by reassuring other community members that the poster has, quote, obviously never felt that way about anyone else, and that, quote, everyone who does this just genuinely sees me as a man. Then the poster expresses contrition and seeks empathy, writing, quote, it's a pretty transphobic thing to keep directing at myself before finally asking for advice on how to train yourself out of it. This poster gets to share a troubling experience of persistent, severe self-doubt, but only in a way that includes no actual exploration of whether this doubt has any basis in reality, or whether such persistent misgivings should tell the poster anything about the advisability of transition. Doubt tends to surface as transition milestones approach, coming out to family or at school, starting testosterone, scheduling a double mastectomy, changing legal documents. And the advice is almost always the same. If you're not sure, take the next step. See how it feels. Fill that prescription and see how it feels to hold a vial of testosterone in your hand or injected in your thigh. You can always change your mind. Never mind that the more costs that you sink, the harder it can be to pull back. Internalized transphobia, imposter syndrome, and intrusive thoughts let members of online communities express and then disown their doubts. So you can say, I can't let go of the fear that I'm faking it and that this is all a huge mistake. But the conclusion is predetermined. Your fears are irrational. Your doubts are misplaced. You must say so yourself and then the community reinforces your refusal to take your questions and doubts as serious challenges to your self-identity and to the decision to transition. Not only that, your doubts are a sign that you're trans. Resistance, doubt, and scruples become part of the heroic arc that leads to accepting your trans identity and embarking on transition. The ways in which the decision to identify as trans and transition mirrors an authentic journey of self-discovery makes it harder to question too. You're overcoming difficulties, including your internal hangups. You're undergoing often painful procedures. You're making hard decisions about who to keep in your life and who to cut out. These are the kinds of things that people do when they are overhauling their lives, whether that's for the better or whether they've joined what, something that many of us think of as a cult. I wanted to wrap up with some quotes from women who've desisted or detransitioned that form the other half of my research in which I really had to fight to keep in the picture because I think that they speak to each other. Um, detransitioners often talk about the discomfort of pretending to be something that you're not or feeling like an imposter or worrying that everyone else is just playing along. And this is often part of the realization that transition isn't working out and that you're not really trans. As one poster put it, I stopped my transition because it started consuming all of my thoughts. I just can't live the rest of my life sometimes feeling like my true self is an imposter. I decided I need to accept that I will never be completely happy with whom I am, and feeding these thoughts will only make them worse. Others talk about how transition often exacerbated their sense of gender dysphoria and the feeling of wrongness in their bodies, even going so far as to say, quote, thinking that I may be trans gave me dysphoria. Another wrote, once you start to hate your body, you can become fixated on it. I was constantly thinking about the idea. And the more I thought about it, the more I hated my body the way that it was. Now I'm starting to understand why the idea resonated with me so much. Transition was a sort of escape route. Others talk about realizing that what transition offered would never be enough. Quote, I'm going to be some aspect of female no matter what I do. I was born female whether I like it or not. I have a genetically and physiologically female body, female chromosomes, a female pattern, bone, and organ development. 
And she asked herself, is that okay? And it was over. That was the center of my thoughts on transitioning, and it was never gonna be okay with me. I wanted to be a biological male so bad, and it would never happen. Finally, they stop believing that the next step will finally deliver on the impossible promises that transition makes. They reflect on the factors that made trans so appealing. Quote, I was in an intense need to find myself and diagnose me with anything to explain why I was suffering. It was my attempt to search for meaning because suffering for no reason is preposterous. And this is my last slide. Um, I realize I'm out of time. Uh, they talk about finally what online trans communities might call their intrusive thoughts and how to listen to those. How to accept the knowledge that they will always be female no matter how much they might wish they had been born male and how they learn to live with reality rather than disown it. I think that these stories show that there's a way out of doubt. Thank you. <laughs>